At Parker, our purpose is simple. We want to make the world a better place. By working more efficiently. By using more sustainable practices. By developing better technologies. We keep moving forward. With each new idea, innovation, and partnership, we're one step closer to fulfilling our purpose every single day. To find out more, visit parker.com slash purpose. Parker, engineering your success. Your host, Andrew Donaldson. This is Heard Tell. Uh, it's Heard Tell Show. It's a Wednesday, halfway through the week, folks. It is April the 20th, year of our Lord, 2022. Yes, that's 420. Go ahead and get your giggles out. Welcome to Heard Tell. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, talk about a couple of really interesting things. Going to take a long conversation with our friend Brent Orrell be our guest from the American Enterprise Institute. He is writing about the decrease of men in the workforce, specifically non-college educated white men leaving the workforce. There's some policy things involved. It touches on things like welfare and social security. And also he brings up the specter of how we dealt with this when we did welfare reform back in the 90s. The ugliness, the welfare queen stuff that we talked about, and that was the narrative. Why isn't men getting saddled with that? And there's some really ugly stuff there to be hashed out, but there's also some policy stuff we need to discuss. Great long conversation with our friend Brett Orrell of AEI on the program today as our guest. Also going to touch on a story at the end of the program. Uh, the Sullivans, a World War II museum ship, partially sank at the moorings. Uh, there's help coming. Chuck Schumer went up there and visited them. He pledged dollars. He's got the horsepower to get them dollars to get it fixed. But also Russia propaganda got a hold of it. Thought they might have something with one of our sailing ships sinking. We'll get into that in the last segment of the program. Also, real briefly, we're going to touch on a piece out of the week. Uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein, there's a lot of speculation about her health and her ability to lead. It's brought up issues of term limits, or should we have age limits and mandatory retirement age? We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But first, let's talk a little bit domestic politics. Um, our friend Eric Garcia has been on this program several times. I need to get him back uh, sometime soon. But Eric wrote a piece uh, at the independent.com co.uk or independent.com in the U.S. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Madison Cawthorn, uh, Rick Gates, if you're Donald Trump, Matt Gates, and uh, Bobbert out in Colorado raised less cash than ever, but are their seats, seats still safe? Interesting phenomenon here where their fundraiser numbers have dropped a bit. Uh, he details this all individually, but the long of the short story is no, their seats are not in danger. But their fundraising has dropped. Now, he goes through these individuals for a couple different reasons, like Gates had to spend a large chunk of money on legal defense, which probably ate into his a little bit. Um, Bobberts is an interesting case. Her opposition rose much more money than she did, but she's actually in a district that got redistrict a little bit, and she's even more Republican than the district she was in before, so she's probably safe. What about Marjorie Taylor Greene? Um, we've been pretty open on this program that sh they should call a vote in Congress and eject her from Congress. She is not fit to lead. They should get a two thirds majority and send her off to go do something else somewhere else and not be in an elected office in our country because she's unfit for it. However, you're not going to beat her electorally. Her fundraising is way down. And Eric makes the uh, very good point that since her personal Twitter account got banned, she still has her official account, which has more restraints on it. Her personal Twitter account got banned. Her fundraising went way down. Now, she's also in a very safe Republican seat. She's probably going to get reelected unless something weird happens. Shame on the people of that district, but reality is reality. There's a couple of points in here that he raises after going through these individually. But Cawthorn's different. Cawthorn, and I think Eric hit the nail on the head about uh, Madison Cawthorn. Uh, remember, we talked about this with our friend Brooke Medina last week. Go back and listen to that good talks if you want to catch up on all the various and insipid nonsense that comes out of that poor man's mouth because he really is unfit as well. They should also vote him out of office. Go ahead and get mad and send your emails at hurtellshowgmail.com. 
Love to hear your hate mail. Might even read it. But anyway, Eric Garcia writing about Madison Cawthorn. Plenty of Democratic small donors are hoping that Mrs. Green's increasingly inflammatory rhetoric makes her vulnerable. However, her district remains safe, as does Gates's, as does Bobbert's, and also likely benefit. They all benefit from being solid red districts. But perhaps the most endangered is Eric Garcia reading from The Independent. Endangered member of the MAGA caucus is Mr. Cawthorn, Madison Cawthorn, out in the western part of North Carolina, who came under fire from House Republican leadership after he said on a podcast that members of Congress were engaged in orgies and did cocaine. But he was also in deep trouble after he attempted to run in a neighborhood, neighboring district and is now trying to run in his old district. But other Republicans in North Carolina's 11th district have refused to pull out after he tried to run in his old district. Unlike the other members in the MAGA cot route, Mr. Cawthorn is perhaps the most endangered because he faces multiple viable Republican Party challengers, and he made sweeping accusations against the Republican caucus rather than simply going after Democrats and the left more generally. Mr. Cawthorn's campaign is bleeding money, spending $690,000 while raising only $658,000. Um, Eric actually has it to the nickel. I'm rounding off here. He also only has $240,000 in cash on hand at the end of the fundraising quarter. That's Eric Garcia writing in the independent comparing the MAGA caucuses things. What's the difference with Cawthorn? The sad political reality is he committed the cardinal sin of going after other Republicans. See, apparently you can do all kinds of insipidous nonsense as long as you aim it at the enemy and say, well, I'm fighting the enemy, in this case, Democrats or progressives or the left or woke or whatever terminology you want to slide in. By the way, he completely lied. He actually admitted that he made up the story. He started backpedaling. He was like, well, maybe a staffer told me that. Maybe it wasn't a member of Congress. This man lies. He lies constantly. He's lied about the accident, put him in the wheelchair. He's lied about trying to get into the Navy Academy. He lies. He lies. He lies some more. Then when he's really in trouble, he serves up a big helping of lie as an entree with a side of lie garnished with lies. This is all he does. He's a spoiled little brat who got into elected office because of connections with his father and because of a personal narrative that on initial blush looked okay, but go to show that there was a lot of real problems underneath. We have the issues from his brief stint in college and the accusations therein. But mostly with Madison Cawthorn, we have his own behavior. He's utterly unfit for office and folks are starting to notice. It's to the eternal shame of the Republican Party, though. They only seem to want to do anything about it when it affects them directly. In this case, he started making waves by trying to go into a different district because of the redistricting in the state of North Carolina and made people mad. And then he accused them of having cocaine fueled orgies, which made them mad. And of course, the fact that he was lying about it was secondary to the fact of who he aimed it at. What a sad state of affairs that we have unfit people for office that we can't seem to do anything about whose people that they are elected to represent don't have enough self-respect to not vote into office in the first place or to vote them out after and a Congress who seems completely unable to police their own and hold themselves to accountability. We'll do our best to try to do it. But the truth is until the voters care, they're going to keep putting bad people in office, and there's not a lot we can do about it. But there are limits, even in MAGA world. And these dips in fundraising numbers go to show it. Good piece by Eric. Make sure you go check it out. We will have more Hurt Tell right after this. Uh, welcome back to Hurt Tell. I'm excited about this one. I love talking to this gentleman. I love interacting with him. On the Twitter, which we do frequently, he's been a good Twitter buddy. He is an august and respected member of the Twitter Supper Club. Uh, but his day job, he's a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. You've seen his writing all over the place. Brent Orrell, sir, how are you? Thank you so much for the time today. I'm doing, I'm doing great. Thank you, Andrew, for having me on. And uh, I almost didn't recognize myself from that introduction. So that's uh, that's terrific. Uh, and I. Big fan of um, of all of your work and Hertel, and it's just uh, it's great to know that there's this voice out there um, that is um, you know trying to present solid arguments to um, an audience that is hard to reach actually. Yeah, it's uh, we very much have a niche media 
but there's some niches we haven't filled the cracks in yet. And we try to do that. That was just my payback for being on your show where we were <laughs> going to talk real big picture stuff and ended up talking about Waffle House. Well, after- no. Is there anything bigger picture than the Waffle House? <laughs> no. I don't think so. No, it is a microcosm of Americana. That's right. Um, but yeah, everybody, we talked for like an hour and a half and all everybody talked about when that release was, hey, you talked to Brett about Waffle House on AEI. <laughs> That's amazing. So I will wear that hat. Proudly do so. Um, we're talking about the piece that you wrote about men in the workforce. I've got to ask you because, and you started your piece out with this, you actually wrote and studied this way back in 2017 as part of a larger uh, poverty study, but you touched on a lot of the same things and then you started the new piece. So let's just start right there. Uh, 2017 till now, what has, or maybe more to the point, what hasn't changed that brought you back to this subject of men in the workforce? Yeah, that's a great place to start. I mean, we have been really since 2015, I think, sort of consumed with this challenge. We didn't realize how big a challenge it was or how big a challenge it was going to present, not just to workforce, um, but to uh, the broader society of this problem of male withdrawal from the workforce. Um, And, you know, uh, the election of Donald Trump to the presidency sort of put this problem front and center on the national agenda. Uh, Everybody started scrambling with, you know, what does this mean? How should we respond? What do these, what do these uh, white non-college educated men in particular want? What do they want? Uh, how, what are, what's wrong? How can we fix it? Then there were a couple you know, very important books. Uh, Nicholas Everstadt here at AEI wrote a good book, a short book on the problem of male workforce disengagement. And, um, and then the two scholars up at Princeton, um, uh, <clears throat> Angus King and, uh, and his wife, whose name is slipping my memory just in the moment, but they wrote, uh, you know, they were, they wrote a book on uh, the deaths of despair, you know, what's, you know, and trying to get a handle on what happened between about 2000 and 2015 uh, as uh, as we went through a really rapid and abrupt, I think, kind of shift in the job market that um, seems to have impacted men um, disproportionately. Um, so uh, those books came out, and then Robert Doerr, who is now the president of AEI, um, I wasn't really working at AEI at that point. I was an outside contributor. Robert Doerr, who led our poverty studies is now president. And then Harry Holzer, who's a very well-known labor economist at Georgetown University. The three of us got together to try to write up some public policy considerations to address the challenge, not so much dwelling. We kind of laid out the, the underlying problem, but we were more interested in what, what might be done um, to help reverse this challenge. So that's what it was. That was our situation for quite a while. And what struck me in, as the economy began to move out of the pandemic um, recession was that the labor market was in fact changing in some ways that were really quite favorable um, toward professions, occupations that have traditionally been male dominated. And you could see this. I mean, we've all heard about the labor shortage, but where is that labor shortage most acute? Well, it's actually most acute in fields like manufacturing and construction, mining, uh, uh, and and other kind of fields that we think of as male-dominated occupations. So my purpose in kind of resurfacing this issue was to say, hey, you know, we may have an opportunity here um, with the way that the the labor market is shifting to have something of a pull as well to pull men back into the workforce, but also a push on the policy side. So that was really the purpose is uh, this article was just to sort of highlight, we have a moment, we don't know how long that moment's going to last, but there are a million open manufacturers a million open manufacturing jobs 
in the United States right now. There are hundreds of thousands of construction jobs and that's projected to increase. Uh, the energy problems that we're experiencing, we ex were experiencing before the war in Ukraine are, as we can see at the gas pump every day, um, just off the charts. We need more people. And traditionally those people have been men. So the jobs are there, but where are the men? Um, where are, what, we've got a lot of folks, a lot of men on still on the sidelines in this country um, uh, of the job market. Where are they and how do we get them back? Yeah, let's start right there with, you can only job, pull from the job pool of the people that you got. It's long been discussed. Uh, we've covered it on this program before. I know you've wrote about this before. It seems like the entirety of our secondary education system is becoming a funnel to college. So how do we wind up with non-college males? We know 60 some percent, it varies a little bit of the population does not have a college degree. If we're going to talk about non-educated white males, how are they winding up that way? Is it the kind of passing of the secondary education vocational system of education? Is it uh, the other yeah. societal factors you talk to? Let's get the nomenclature right of why are they college non-educated in the first place? Because there's a lot of them out there. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, I, this, the, these uh, are complex questions. And our tendency with complex questions is to try to simplify them rather than acknowledge the complexity and figure out how to respond. So... Um, Progressives and conservatives have diametrically different analyses, <laughs> diametrically opposed analyses of what the problem is. Um, uh, back in the 1990s, when we went for, through the first round of this, it was predominantly black men who were the point of greatest concern. And the argument from the progressives was this isn't a problem of culture. It's not a problem of morale. It's not a, a, a problem of character. It's really a problem of the jobs having picked up and moved away from where these men lived, right? They, the, the, the industrial sites uh, where, where industry was located, located, concentrated in the cities some of that just went away, period, but some of it actually just moved. It moved to the suburbs or it moved from uh, Michigan to um, Atlanta or it moved to the Southwest. You know, the, there was both sort of an internal ge geographic displacement and an international geographic displacement, but, but progressives insisted that this was a structural problem uh, and not a cultural problem. Uh, conservatives came at this from exactly the opposite perspective. In fact, one of our scholars here at AEI, Charles Murray, has written very persuasively on this, that you can't explain the withdrawal from work only with structural factors. In fact, what may be more important is the collapse in morale and the belief uh, in work morale and the belief that um, that working hard every day is a primary value, right? These are, these are values, these are things that really characterize the white working class in this country. Um, this is how men define their, uh, their character, their, um, their personhood was as workers and providers for their families. And that, uh, that, it was that that was the collapse that was going on in the 1990s among black men was that that collapse in identification with work. So we fast forward to 2015 and many of the conservatives, not all, certainly not Charles Murray, um, really uh, began to migrate toward the progressive position. Right. They looked at white male uh, unemployment and said to themselves, well, uh, this can't be, this can't be really, be, these are our people. These, these can't be, this can't be a cultural problem, right? This has to be structural. They, they took on a lot of the structural argument saying it was trade. 
it was automation. It was uh, the displacement of communities from uh, from good jobs or good jobs being displaced away from the communities where they've tr traditionally been housed. So don't blame don't blame the the, the men. Blame the trade agreement, um, and that turned out to be a very potent political argument um, uh, and something that Donald Trump uh, really, you know, ran on in large part was the sort of resentment um, about economic change. So it, that, that argument, it, it's, it was just remarkable to me. And that, this is another one of the things sort of that the, the change has really become so apparent is that Conservatives, particularly those that we think of as kind of the national conservatives, the more populist uh, part of the Republican Party, which is most of the Republican Party now, um, uh, really have adopted this um, structuralist argument uh, rather than thinking about the harder questions of agency, uh, you know, personal decision making and choices. The willingness to move um, when you need to find a new job, uh, that all of the things that are internal have kind of been uh, have been discounted. So that was the, to me, the really remarkable and kind of profound shift that has gone on is that uh, in the political debate, it's just that conservatives now sound a lot like the progressives of the 1990s. So in the way you wrote it is if the populist moment is saying, well, it's not the men themselves, it's system structures and policies. And that's traditionally the, you know, the progressive argument. Well, it's systematic and it's structures and policies. What does the data say, though? Is it a little bit of both? Is there a mixture in the spectrum that we're missing and waiting across? What does the actual data say when you lay it out, though? Yeah. So th there's no there is no question that that the economy has changed, right? We went from an agri primarily agricultural economy in the 19th century to the industrial revolution, which carried us into the 1970s, which then be began the shift toward the information economy and is now um, largely uh, moved into knowledge, information, and services. That, that, that's the dominant. 80% of American jobs are in the service sector. We still produce a tremendous amount of stuff in this country. Manufacturing is far from dead. We just do it with a lot fewer people than we used to do. Uh, and that's the automation question. So to answer your question, that's what I said at the beginning, like we want a simple narrative about this. What we've got is really complicated narrative these problems, the structural problems and the cultural problems feed off of one another. Um, if a business can't find an adequate workforce that incentivizes the move toward automation, uh, uh, not that it needs a whole lot of incentivizing. Uh, you know, if the jobs disappear, people do get discouraged. It is hard, uh, I'm not discounting that. Um, and, uh, and morale is affected. Um, by that. So it becomes kind of a vicious cycle more than anything else. Yeah, we're talking to Brett Orell of the AEI. Uh, he's got a piece out about men. We're going to talk about that vicious cycle when we come back because uh, bad economics fuels cultural issues and vice versa. We're going to dig into that. Also, uh, this is actually a new spin on an old topic. We're going to go all the way back to the 90s like he does at the end of the piece, kind of compare and contrast how it was discussed there and how it was discussed now. More with Brent Orell on Hertel right after this. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. I'm Andrew Donaldson. We're joined by Brent O'Rell, Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, good friend of the program, been a Twitter buddy for a long time. Thrilled to talk to him again. All right, where we left off, we were talking about these cultural issues and the economic issues, and they can never really be separated. When we talk about a specific demographic like the white, non-educated male workforce, and you start talking about poverty things, which was kind of the genesis of this way back when, when you first started studying it, you talk about things like opioid addiction. You talk about things like uh, disability 
uh, and that there can be some abuse inside of that system once people are disaffected and or fall into problems, both real, imagined and of their own making. These things feed each other because when you don't have an economic option, that's when a lot of those worst parts of our culture start rearing their head back and forth. Is that showing up in the data when you're talking about this missing male workforce? I got to imagine it's not only a trend, but it seems to be a steady trend now. Yeah, and that was a major point that I wanted to address through the essay because I, it points to kind of a fundamental inequity in the way that we treat economic disadvantage as it relates to men compared to what we've done uh, relative to, to women primarily in this country, which is in the mid-1990s, 1996, we passed a welfare reform uh, law that said uh, non-custodial parents, or I'm sorry, custodial parents who are mainly women uh, and who are on the TANF program, the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families program, which is the main cash welfare program in the United States, uh, we're going, we're, we would henceforth only allow people to stay on that program for five years, five years max. And while you're on the program, uh, a woman who's on the program, a, a mom who's on the program um, is required to pursue work um, and the things that facilitate work. And we said, we're going to subsidize your wages through the EITC. We're going to provide uh, a child care voucher program for low-income moms so they could afford, you know, a safe place to put their children when they went back to work. But we said that work was the expectation, that it was bad for people um, to not work, not just in the sense of being dependent upon uh, the taxpayers for their subsistence, which is, you know, it's a miserable way to live, um, but because it's bad for people, it's bad for their spirits, it's bad for their morale, it's bad for their physical health not to be uh, in the workforce. The work, work meets a whole bunch of different needs, social and economic, in our lives. And it's a, it, we said to women, you have, women, low income women with children, you have to go back to work. We have never said that to men. Um, largely because men are not connected to our welfare systems in the same way that women with children are, uh, unless they happen to be a custodial parent. Men sort of just like, they, they almost don't exist from a public policy perspective, except for things like uh, the Child Support Enforcement Program, which is one of these you know, efforts to try to get non-custodial dads to cough up. Uh, when it comes to the economic maintenance of their children. So from a policy perspective, men just don't show up in our systems very much, but they do show up in some places, right? One of those, one of the most significant is uh, the disability program. There is an argument to be made that SSI, SSDI, uh, supplemental security income, supplemental security disability insurance income um, have uh, become a long-term welfare benefit for men like TANF, except that it's unlimited. Um, once you qualify for it and keep getting certified as being disabled, you're never going to lose those benefits. Now, if you are disabled, then you need that, that maintenance support, right? The question is, is there some portion of the SSI, SSDI population that isn't disabled, really disabled, or could be accommodated in, a, in ways that made it possible for them to work? Uh, are, are, are the screens tight enough to sort of divert people away from that program and encourage them, to, you know, point them back toward the workforce rather than um, allowing them to get on? Because getting on SSDI is like a, a slow death sentence. Um, people get on, men get on it. They're, they were already in not great shape. I mean, you can't just jump onto it at will. You have to have some sort of medical justification for this. So they're already in not great shape, but then sitting around all day is horrible for your health. Um, and that's what we know about these men who aren't working is that they aren't doing, they aren't doing anything. 
uh, really, uh, on average, they're working about uh, any kind of work, paid, unpaid, caring for family, whatever it is, it's about 45 minutes a day. Um, and that is really bad for your mental, physical, emotional, spiritual health. Um, and so we want, what the article proposes is that we need to look at these uh, the, the program, the SSI, SSDI programs, and really try to figure out, is there a better way um, to structure these programs so that only those who are really, really disabled get that subsidy? And those who are moderately or mildly disabled don't wind up in the program. We also need to look at food stamps, um, which is one of the programs that men can get um, support through uh, uh, without being responsible for caring for children. And uh, it has an employment component to it, but it's voluntary. There's no requirement. There should We should be looking at ways, again, of creating an incentive structure that points people back toward the workforce <clears throat> so that people don't just fall into this trap of taking public benefits. You know, frankly, I think it's just really hard on self-esteem. Um, once you become dependent, it's it can become a vicious self-fulfilling prophecy in your life that I can't work. So anyway, those are a couple of the programs um, that, that I was thinking about. Um, you know that there's some there's some reforms I think that are needed both to equalize treatment between men and women, but also to ensure that we are applying the same principles of redirection back toward the job market. We continue our conversation with Brett Orell of the American Enterprise Institute on Hartel right after this. At Parker, our purpose is simple. We want to make the world a better place by working more efficiently, by using more sustainable practices, by developing better technologies. We keep moving forward. With each new idea, innovation, and partnership, we're one step closer to fulfilling our purpose every single day. To find out more, visit parker.com slash purpose. Parker, engineering your success. Yeah, and I remember uh, speaking with Brent Orell of the American Enterprise Institute, our good friend. I, I remember that. Uh, I've talked before the Clinton years were my formative political years. My first election was the 98 midterm that well induced me today because I've learned I learned some good lessons back then about hypocrisy. Um, I remember that uh, the term was welfare queen. Uh, it was yeah. very, very if you go back, I, I bet a lot of people would get canceled if their comments back then would get put out on Twitter. Now we didn't have social media. Then. It was a lot of ugly stuff. I was in West Virginia growing up. Uh, they sent camera crews from the national networks down to the trailers and started pulling people out of them. And that, here's the welfare queens. I remember all that. That was another time is part of the problem here. And this is not a new problem with SSDI, but it is an all or nothing system. And it takes you forever to get the all. And then the all is even once you get the all, even if you get full non-workable disability, it's still kind of this no man land between a living income and poverty with the technology now, um, part of the problem is we need a scalable SSDI system, don't we? Because it needs to take into account things like the gig economy. It needs to take into account virtual work. These people, look, I'm one of them. I sit here and do this now because I can't do a quote unquote real job anymore because I'm disabled because of mental and physical disabilities, but I can be productive. There's folks that could be productive, but because of the way SSDI is structured is that all or nothing. And then once it's your all, they absolutely wear those folks out with, don't you dare go make money. Don't right. you dare go make more than whatever the, I think it's $1,200 yeah. now, whatever the current, cause it scales that, that creates that mentality. It's not just the people wanting to be that way. The system funnels them into being that way. Yeah. And technology has switched now where these people, well, why couldn't we give them a, you know, like the military system, for example, where you get, well, you get a 30% and you can work this gig economy job from home and we'll gap it and things like that. I think we just have an obsolete system and time has kind of passed it by. Does that feel that way to you? I, it, uh, I, you know, it's a really good point. One I hadn't thought of in exactly the way that you just talked about it. 
Um, but right, uh, it's part of this incentive structure that says don't work. You want to keep your benefits, and it may not be. It may be less actually the money than the eligibility for health benefits that um, that gets in the way. You know, like I can't afford to take a job that doesn't provide health care benefits. And your children get benefits if you're 100 percent serious. Yeah. You know, considerable benefits that that's a portion to them too, because yeah. you're talking about educational benefits and stipends. So yeah, I mean, I I, I, I like that idea of uh, and that there's a Within the SSI SSDI program, there's something called Ticket to Work, which is intended to provide services and supports to people who want to try to work but are on SSI and don't want to lose everything in the process. So that that idea is there, but it's all voluntary. And I think that we need to shift to a system in which the assumption is that we can find something for you to do, um, that you can be engaged as a worker, you can contribute to the main, your own maintenance, and then whatever the gap is between what you can earn and what you need, we subsidize because that's what we did. That's what we're doing with TANF uh, recipients. Is we're saying, all right, maybe you're only get a, getting a minimum wage job. So if you are. Then you've got the EITC that supplements the, your income, the earned income tax credit subsidizes your income so that you're making enough combined between your, earn, <clears throat> your earned salary and your tax benefit to make it possible to, to you know, do a little bit better than just subsisting. You know, we, don't, we, don't want, we don't want people to be locked into subsistence. Um, by um, by welfare programs. Another interesting area, and this is something you probably know something about, but uh, based on your 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 career in the Air Force, is veterans benefits. Veteran but veterans benefits can function in kind of the same way if they're you know they're based on disability, and you can sort of stack up those benefits, various kinds of, of benefits, and wind up. Um, really disincentivized from working. We need everybody. We've got a labor shortage. We, I've never thought of any human being as being dispensable, but the indispensability of people is really in front of us right now uh, in terms of the shortage in the labor market. So let's make the most of that. Let's get as many people back in the workforce as we can. Yeah, talking to Brett Orell, a friend from AEI. Uh, as a way to kind of recap some of this, because again, it's a huge topic. Uh, your new piece is great on it. It also links back to the older work you've done. I encourage folks to read it. We'll be part of this. I think everything we do nowadays, especially when it's a heavy topic like this, there's a language barrier to it. You already touched on it that the can the populist notion and the progressive notion has kind of met in a certain way with the way the language approaches it. We already know that talking about uh, men in this regard is a little bit fraught. What language wise should we be doing to approach? Because again, well, we touched on, we don't want to do the welfare queen thing again, because that was ugly and it was uncalled for. And it was, you know, very misogynistic, quite frankly. We don't want to do that with these men because we already seen what happens when they get, when they really get disinfected and victimized, bad things Mm -hmm. happen. What's the terminology we should be using to, to go after them. I know we got acronyms for it for the academic side, but when we're just on our social media or advocating about it, what's the way we should address this, do you think? Yeah, so I, again, really terrific question. Uh, I think if I were uh, thinking about this from the standpoint of what women have had to put up with uh, in terms of the way that they've been talked about as uh, welfare queens and dependent, you know, I, I, I guess my sympathy might be a little bit limited. And, and let's be honest, right? That language as applied to women was not just misogynistic, it was frequently racist. I mean, it was, it was about um, black women, right? That were um, caricatured uh, for political purposes. We don't wanna do that. We don't wanna dehumanize people. Um, so we need to avoid those kinds of stereotypes. We just, it, it, it strikes me as uh, historically, an historic, uh, historical I- irony that 
the very language that was used to caricature women was targeted at the demographic that we're talking about now. It was targeted toward um, ginning up and um, amplifying resentments for the purposes of politics. There is some accountability. There needs to be some acknowledgement in my view that that's what happened uh, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, that that was part of what was going on. The flip side of that is that these current conditions totally undermine the idea that this was somehow about gender or race. This is, this is a human problem that affects all kinds of human beings, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, whatever categories you want to throw in there. Uh, and that this human problem requires solidarity across the social and economic spectrum. We need to acknowledge that just as uh, the women that we talked about in the past had structural disadvantages that played an important part in their dependency. We need to look at our current dependency problem and say, yes, there are structural elements here that have to be, that have to be dealt with, economic, social, cultural. Um, but we need to be honest that that's a big change in everyone's tune from where we were in the 1990s. And that there needs to be a little bit of a reckoning um, around that. Um, just, you know, truth and reconciliation. We need, we need truth about this, um, about the, uh, some of our attitudes from the past. Yeah, that reckoning that is always just over the next hill, my Uncle Denny yeah. say when we're hiking and you never <laughs> yeah. quite ever got over the next hill. But yeah. thus, yeah. we have work to do still, my friend, and we'll continue to talk to you about it because you do good work. We're going to have you back on frequently because you're you're so insightful and you've been a good friend and we appreciate this. Until we get you back, let folks know where they can find you and your work and your social media so they can keep track of you until we talk to you again on our tell. So I'm, uh, as, as you already said, I'm active. Some would say way too active on Twitter, um, and it's at Orell O R R E L L A E I um, uh, is where you can connect with me. There, uh, I I'm also on LinkedIn. If anybody wants to, is working off of LinkedIn, uh, and um, and then of course. Uh, everything that I write um, for my job is published at AEI.org. Uh, and you can search my scholar page. I have a, you know, a, a page that's just about my work, all of my work. Um, so those are the, the best ways. Um, and always anxious to hear uh, from people who are reading the work. Um, I, I really, a lot of people don't like comment sections on uh, on their articles, I actually like comment sections. Um, I, if they're if they're horrible and mean and nasty, I don't respond. But if somebody raises a question, uh, I want to think about it and respond to it. Um, so always always glad to hear from people. Um, and you can reach me and my, my email is on the on the web page. Yeah, one of the things we're proud of at Ordinary Times for 15 years. Uh, with with a few exceptions, because everybody's got their special cases, uh, we're pretty proud of the comment sections. Pretty, pretty high end folks, and I agree because that's that's where you get a little bit of the the push and pull where creation happens. So, mm -hmm. uh, you do good work, sir. I appreciate your time greatly on this. A lot to chew through this. We could probably do four or five of these on there. We might do it, <laughs> and someday soon, you and I will share a booth at the Waffle House, my friend. Sounds that good. sounds great. I can't wait. Thank you for your time, sir. Appreciate it. You bet. Thanks. Going back to her tell, just briefly want to touch on this story over at the week. Joel Mathis is writing about Senator Dianne Feinstein. Uh, it's been a poorly kept secret among congressional reporters, staffers, and people that pay attention to such things that uh, Senator Feinstein, with all due respect to her and her long service to the country in elected office, uh, is not what she once was. You can parse out how bad 
uh, her decline health wise and mentally wise is to your own preference. I don't really want to go there, but to suffice to say that the senator is not what she once was and probably should not be serving in office. Um, she's 88 years old as of right now, uh, even by the standards where we have Chuck Grassley and Joe Biden and others in high office, Nancy Pelosi's over 80. Uh, she has clearly not up to the task, but we don't have any mechanism of removing her other than her constituencies voting her out. And we're not going to bet this and it's not going to remove her. Uh, but it's something that brought up term limits again. Uh, they're never going to do this, but I'm going to just say it anyway. Uh, I don't, I've changed my mind. I don't know that we need term limits because that's a little bit arbitrary. I do think we should have a mandatory federal retirement age. We demand it of our military service, of our generals. They have to retire at certain ages. You just cannot do the job anymore. We should not have octogenarians in our high places of office affecting our country. It's just not healthy. We should have a nice number. Pick, pick one, 70, 75, 76, whatever. Go ahead and sling all your email at me about being ageist. It's just true. At some point, you need to not do it anymore, and you need to make way for the next generation. Uh, we should pick a number and do it. They'll never do that, but no, I'm not so much for term limits, but I would like to see a mandatory retirement age on nationwide office. More hurt tell right after this. Now let me see you go off like a bomb. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. We usually end on a good or a happy note. This is a melancholy note, but there's some good news coming, apparently. I'm a huge fan of museum ships. I love them. I think they're an important thing of our history for people to be able to go and walk on them. I remember going places like the USS North Carolina as a kid with my parents, and I've got to do that since with my children. Uh, the USS The Sullivans, one of the real unique names in the history of the U.S. Navy. I'll touch on why that is in a minute. Uh, listing almost sank at its birthing on Lake Erie in Buffalo. Uh, the hull was breached. They still don't know exactly what happened, but it almost sank. Salvage crews have reached what they call the equilibrium point. So even though the ship is heavily listed and partially submerged on one side, it's not going to sink. They're taking out as much water as coming in. Uh, Chuck Schumer, the majority leader, obviously a Democrat from New York, visited the site and has pledged federal assistance. We covered on the show that earmarks are back. Uh, it didn't take him long. Uh, Chuck Schumer very bluntly said, I'm going to make a big earmark for this, quote unquote. Um, Schumer noted that there's $500 million in the federal budget for the National Maritime Heritage Grant Program. That goes to things like museum ships. He said, quote, but I'm going to, in the defense bill this year, get a much higher amount and have a good chunk of that earmarked for our Naval Park. Um, it's good politics, obviously. Buffalo would be an important part if you're running for statewide office, but also it's good use of government funds. I'm a huge proponent of museum ships. The Sullivans is the name of the ship. It's weird to have a ship named the Sullivans. If you're not familiar with the story, uh, the five Sullivan brothers, a working class family back during World War II, all five of them died on the USS Juno when it was torpedoed by the Japanese, almost 700 people uh, lost with that ship, including all five of the Sullivan brothers. In honor of their commitment and their sacrifice, the uh, Fletcher-class destroyer, the Sullivans, was deemed. Once it was retired, it was moved up to Buffalo, where it's been for many, many years. I'm glad they're going to fix it. I'm glad they're going to raise it. Uh, one side note, and another reason I brought this up, Russian propaganda, believe it or not, after the Moscova was sunk by the Ukrainians, there were misinformation bots in the bot farms and the trolls that was using the sinking of the Sullivans and saying the U.S. had a destroyer sank. No, it was the Sullivans. It didn't all the way sink. It's just submerged. The pictures look bad, look worse than what it is. They're going to get it straightened out. But no, that is not the ship in Russia propaganda that we lost a destroyer. It's a World War II museum ship in Buffalo, and we're going to fix it. And the Sullivans can continue to educate and help people remember for many years to come. That'll do it for her tell today. Great show. Really appreciate Brent O'Rell being on. More great guests coming. Make sure you reach out to us at her tell show on Gmail at her tell show on the Twitter. Love to hear from you. Make sure you're subscribing YouTube channel, all the podcasting platforms. Glad to have you along. So until we see you again tomorrow, we hope you're well. We hope you're well fed. And we'll see you tomorrow on her tell. All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. Oh,